Koka sunarai sunarayanti 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 Hello, hi, welcome to the fourth episode of the Psychedelic Confessions. Today we have a friend of mine, I'm a big fan of Christian Joknik, and I asked him for a brief bio, that's what he sent me. Venture investor, regenerative farmer, and psychonaut, with a passion for exploring how we can live better together with ourselves, each other, and nature. And uh, I, I, I feel so much resonance for this. I think that, you know, that would be my bio, my bio also. <laughs> So, yes, I want to, to remind our listener that we're going to go substance by substance, and the objective of this special series of psychedelic confessions is for experienced people that have been doing this compound seriously and with respect for many years to share their experience from a personal point of view, so real experiential. And, you know, now, as you guys know, psychedelic is becoming so popular, the ceremony is left, right, and center, and sometimes... These compounds are misused, and, uh, and it's, it's a pity because with the right guidelines, they can be so effective and so powerful, not just for healing, but just for life wellness. And, and as, as, as Christian said, to, to become uh, better at living together with each other and with nature. Okay, so let's jump straight in. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, Giancarlo. So nice to be here. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we have 10 compounds today. It's the usual suspect. Let's start with cannabis. So cannabis, I have a long history with cannabis. You know, I grew up in Sweden and in Sweden, drugs have been very stigmatized for a long, long time. And there's been a lot of fear mongering around drugs. And I was definitely a victim of that. I was very fearful towards drugs and substances uh, quite late into my life, late talking about, you know, late teens, 18, 19, when I first smoked, I think maybe 17. And I had a funny start with cannabis. I, I got a lot of anxiety, a lot of paranoia. I didn't feel very good, but I kept hearing what everyone was talking about, how amazing it was. So I kind of like kept pushing myself to break through that that face of it. And, and I did. Um, and I, I developed a very healthy relationship, I think, with cannabis. Of course, it was the first few years when, you know, we were just driving around and getting stoned and, you know, smoking all the time. And I think the first thing I discovered uh, was maybe not the healthy side. It was, you know, this, this notion of uh, stagnation, seeing a lot of my friends kind of not progressing in their life. How old, were, how old were you now? You know, this was maybe like after high school, you know, just when you get into your early uh, professional years when you get your first job. And, and I could definitely uh, see... After it, college? Uh, no, after high school. Okay. So... 18. Uh, yeah, 18, 19, 20. And I remember, you know, we would sit every day at someone's house smoking weed, playing poker, playing FIFA, and, you know, uh, and it was nice. But two things that came out that was cautionary was I saw a lot of friends stagnating in their development. I got a job in an interesting organization working with youth. I moved to another part of town and my life really took off. I kept smoking every night. I came home from work, had a joint and so on. And then five, six years later, I, I remember coming to my friend's house and looking around and the same guys doing exactly the same thing four, five, six years later. And it just was so clear that cannabis can really hold you back hold you back and take away this drive and take away this curiosity and you you can easily get stuck in pattern and another thing was this this notion of like Hey guys, should we go to the movies? Yeah, amazing. Who's got weed? No one's got weed. Okay, let's skip the movies. Then all of a sudden, you cannot enjoy anything in life without smoking a joint. And this was kind of a bit of a warning sign uh, for me. So these, these were things that I kept paying attention to. But for me, it I had this really profound 
experience with cannabis early on when I began my professional career. And I remember going to work and getting stuck in, you know, relationship and situations and issues. And then I came home at the end of the day and I smoked a joint. And then I realized like, wow, this situation I experienced today, there's a whole different perspective to it. And it unlocked many things on a much more subtle level, on a much more uh, personal level, where I, for the first time, experienced my ability to change my perspective on a situation and see how that can unlock blockages in in your life. Everything from re- relationship blockages to professional blockages. And, and it became a tool for me to challenge my assumptions about my thoughts and my, my reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe there's also a little bit of a, maybe a, a uh, uh, effect of, of moral prioritization. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt that you know when when it would I would use it for conflict resolution with wife, mm-hmm. and it, it really it very really, there is a sense of expansion of of consciousness. Yeah, and you know, it's often referred to as uh, Santa Maria, Mary mm-hmm. Jane, mm-hmm. and 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 cannabis does have a a, a feminine spirit mm-hmm. somehow, and I think for men. Uh, at least for myself, uh, I, I, I often, for example, I always had my best conversation with my mother mm. when I was stoned. You know, in the beginning, I was nervous talking yeah. to my mom when I was stoned. After a while, I realized like, oh, I'm going to I want to call my mom. I smoke a joint. Yeah, you're, and more, I call you're my more patient. You're more patient. You're more patient. More empathic. I'm more tuned into the subtleties yeah. and I could see myself notice small details like objects in the house and, yeah. and it yeah. tunes you into a different perspective that yeah. I think is more feminine. Yeah, there was an article in the New York Times where this actually, I think it was a, a doctor, the title was uh, When a Backache Improve Your Parent Parent Skill <laughs> because he went to a doctor for this backache and he got some edible <laughs> and he said, yes, the the, the backache the back went away, but it was incredible how the relationship with my young kids improved in terms of, you know, the, the time I would spend with them drawing and doing things, you know, before the edible was like, okay, dad, can we do something? Okay, here's the iPad. Now is let's draw together, let's play together. So... That's that's yeah. definitely for sure. I mean, oh. the danger I would say with cannabis, yeah, though, let's go to danger. <laughs> yeah, is 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 that it's very easy to get stuck in the patterns um, to abuse. The good thing is that. I don't experience a physical addiction. So, for example, I smoked uh, uh, weed f- every day for seven years, and then I met my my partner. And from one day to another, I stopped because I came home every day. And by the time I used to smoke my joint, I got on Skype and I didn't want to be like stoned and, and clueless in our conversation. I wanted to be sharp and witty. So I just stopped and it, I didn't even reflect on it. It just from one day to another, it disappeared from my life. But on the flip side, it's also very easy because when I reintroduced uh, cannabis in my life, it was very much like, oh, a weekend thing, and then it became an evening thing, and then it became an after work thing, and then it became an after lunch thing, and then all of before you know it, you're waking and baking. So it, it creeps into your life, and I think uh, your relationship, the only thing I can recommend to everyone is to be very attentive to you know, your relationship to cannabis. And I think one thing that I perceive in my relationship to to cannabis, I still today, some of my best ideas come through cannabis when when I change my perspective and, and it opens up. But I get stuck at the at the high level thinking. As soon as you get into detail, it becomes difficult to pay attention. And not only when you're stoned, but in your day-to-day life. So when I get into a pattern of smoking daily, I also see that I, I, I get drawn to thinking about new and exciting ideas rather than going deep and dealing with the details and implementing. And it um, can actually uh, create uh, quite a lot of issues in my life because I keep jumping from idea to idea and then I create a lot of ideas and, and start a lot of processes but without anchoring them and going through the details and, and, yeah. and making sure. And, and it can create a little bit of an unstable and unproductive environment where yeah. there's a lot of talk and a lot of ideas, yeah. but very little actually happening. Yeah, and the collaborators get confused on yes. the priorities. Yes. Very good. Let's jump on uh, MDMA. 
so MDMA, I mean, I was very resistant to MDMA. You know, I heard from people that once you take an MDMA, you don't want to drink anymore. And as a good Swede, I loved to get drunk when I was uh, younger. Oh, wow. So I was like rejecting it because I didn't want to lose my love for alcohol. Oh, I never <laughs> heard that. That's so funny. Was, it was quite funny. And then when I had it, of course, it opened up. Wow, it was just uh, these feelings. And I think most importantly, going to a party and enjoying it and really being present and and remembering the next day. And, um, you know, I know this, you know, about the Tuesday blues and, and so on, but at least the hangover was not the type of hangover they get from alcohol. And, and I could feel that it was... For me, it was a revolution in in enjoying celebration. And for many years, I was, you know, a big fan of celebratory MDMA use. And so I, I had a fond fond relationship. And actually, one of my first, I remember being in DC10 here on the B side, taking MDMA, and then I smoked a nice charas joint, and then I went into the dance floor and just went inside and just finding this very clear channel of not just amazing, beautiful, constructive thoughts coming from the heart, but also this feeling in the whole body that uh, just made me feel very connected uh, to myself and to my heart and to the people I care for. And I would uh, start to kind of like go through my life on the dance floor, almost like what I experienced later on in life in in in, in ceremonies. Uh, so I think that was maybe my first kind of ceremonial experience with it when I tuned into that mind space uh, of connection. So so I, I had some some profound experiences of MDMA and I will I will never forget, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, the capacity of MDMA in couples therapy. And even though I've never used it intentionally for couples therapy, I remember, you know, me and my partner, we were having a, uh, we were at space and we came in and we had a moment there where for one and a half hours, we just started talking. We were standing in a corner and we were just talking about really the early formative months of our relationship and really opening up and sharing some core vulnerabilities that was so obviously creating barriers in our relationship. And, and you know, we are not together today, but that opened up, you know, a good, like a whole new phase in our relationship that led to marriage and led to two beautiful children and to many beautiful years together. And I really can see that without that experience, I, I'm not sure we would have arrived where we arrived at, which I'm eternally grateful for. And that from that moment on, I every time you know, it's just so obvious how this compound can be very, very constructive for any form of relationship process, you know, whether it's a business partner, whether it's a wife, I'm sure, you know, with with your children uh, when they grow older and you want to kind of like revisit childhood and traumas and blockages in, in relationships, you know, there's no doubt. And I, I, I really salute Rick Doblin and MAPS to opening this pathway for MDMA yeah. to get a formal role in, in our society, because I think it's going to have tremendous beneficial capacity for, yeah. for yeah. healing and progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for, for me, the, the, the clear thing was to what extent it would allow me to see whatever dispute, whatever misunderstanding from the other person's point of view. Yes. It's almost like magic. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. And, and, and this letting your guard down. Letting, uh, yeah. letting feeling, your guard feeling vulnerable. Down, and just expressing yourself from the heart and not from the mind. And I think it, it does that in, in a brilliant way. Yeah. Let, let me ask you something a little bit outside of the experience of the, of the medicine, more into your investor knowledge. Now, MDMA for PTSD will go in phase three this year, mm -hmm. and then hopefully it will be available to licensed therapists to buy it and then to give it to their patient. But how much um, flexibility would therapists have in terms of, I mean, 
do they have to be only PTSD to start with, or it can be couple therapy? No, I mean, I, 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 this is a very technical question, yeah. <laughs> and I don't have the technical answer, but from my experience, there's this kind of something called off-label label prescription. Mm. So uh, this, they will not be able to advertise anything but the, uh, the regulated, the, the approved registered condition, but they can recommend it. Or if you ask for it, they can offer it. So I think there will be an off-label path that you can explore. So, so I'm sure it will open up the potential to use these compounds in more than uh, more areas and in especially couples therapy, conflict resolution beyond the, the post-traumatic stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's going to have like another 100 million patients. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <coughs> Very good. That's very, that's very interesting. And, and I think my relationship to MDMA today uh, has become less and less. I, I, I'm, I'm less attracted to it today. I think it's inherently a depletive compound and you can feel it. Yeah. Uh, I've never really suffered from the kind of Tuesday blues. It's never been, I'm relatively stable in my, my, my state of, of being. I don't, I don't go much up and down typically. So it's never been a like, oh, I suffer two days after, but, but I can still feel it in my body that this is not a healthy process yeah. if you do it too often and yeah. if you do it too 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 much and 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 I think every once in a while maybe once a year once or twice a year, a year yeah. I, I I I take a little you know yeah shot glass of of MDMA at a party and 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 if it's combined with with other substances but yeah. Typically, what you see here in the in the in the parties, yeah. Well, but I think in our community, yeah. like when 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 I have a party and when I s serve it, then typically it's like one chupito is one sixteenth of a gram. Mm -hmm. So it's a very very low dose. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something with all compounds you see over time. Uh, you you need less and less, and less is more. I think this is really something that we are discovering more and more. And if we just look at our circle of friends, if you look at the amounts people took 10 years ago and the amounts people are taking today, yeah. it gradually gets less and less yeah. because you don't need as much as you think you do. Yeah. And, and, and dosing is everything. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. it really it really makes the whole difference. Yeah. A, a tiny bit of MDMA can unlock something. Yeah. A little bit too much just takes away the vibe and yeah. everyone is grinding yeah. their teeth and waking up the next day feeling depleted. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm very cautious with, with MDMA as a substance. And when I do take it, I take it in incredibly small amounts, yeah. just as a little supplement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in Burning Man with Sasha Shulgin many years ago. And he told me, this is something you can do once a year. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so psilocybin. So psilocybin was my first psychedelic experience, and I was about 18 years old in, in uh, Koh Panyang. Big, big, big dose? Uh, I have no idea. I <laughs> ate an omelette uh, for breakfast, and then, <laughs> and then I walked up uh, the mountain. It was one of those glorious days in nature, and it was not very trippy. Like, it was not visual at all. It was very kind of physical, and, and I just had this profound moment when I was just looking out over the ocean and laughing to myself and just repeating to myself, it's so simple, it's so easy, it's so easy, it's so simple. And I was just laughing and just, I can't remember what it was <laughs> that was so simple, but it was just, I, 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 it's a feeling that I've been carrying with me. Mm. And, and I remember so clear that I had this feeling that I felt excited like an eight-year-old boy and wise like an 80-year-old monk mm. at the same time. And this combination of being able to hold those two dimensions at the same time, this curiosity and excitement and childlike exuberance together with this calmness and stillness and, 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 and focus and attention. 
and to be able to hold those two perspectives in the same moment uh, was just expanded my capacity of what I can feel and how I can think and how I can live. And it's I think there's definitely like a pre and a post psilocybin for me. And and then I I obviously wanted to share this with my friends back in Sweden and you know we had a few moments out in the archipelago, you know, beautiful moments together with friends in nature. And it was a stark contrast from the horror stories I've heard growing up about people going to Amsterdam, taking mushrooms and then freaking out and lying under a bed and being, you know, traumatized Monsters for hours. And- and I think, you know, I think this is, you know, very clear for everyone today, but it, you can never repeat it often enough. It's like set and setting and those is key for any psychedelic experience. And, you know, the only thing I can say is, you know, be in nature, be with a small group of friends, be with people that you trust, and then, you know, everything is and 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 to <laughs> someone said you can always take more but you can never take less mm-hmm. so you know build up slowly and 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 see where you arrive stage by stage but yeah so psilocybin really opened up this uh, in me and and I don't think I appreciated it at the time but it's it's been staying with me ever since that moment it really shifted uh, my perspective of myself and 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 uh, my self identity somehow so the advice you have for someone that wants to try first of all to 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 find a, a facilitator or a guide or someone who had experience with this compound who maybe takes just a little bit and is there to hold space to make sure that is there to you know provide for you know basic needs if you're cold if you're hot if you're thirsty and 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 just give you this sense that you're take, taking care of that's a psychological set. Look, I mean, yes, if you want to go for a big dose, then what you described is the, is the way to go. I do think that there's an entry level that is totally doable. And I, we talked about it the other day, actually. And I think, actually, it's, it's better that you give yourself than that you have a facilitator that you don't trust. And trust is the key for any psychedelic yeah, experience. but that's maybe that's not just the two options. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you have the option that you have a facilitator that you trust. Of course, <laughs> of course. And But I think the, what you need to trust is you need to trust the environment and the space that you're in. And, and, and if, you, if you don't have a facilitator, be very careful about dosing, you know. Start it's, with it, one, two grams. Yeah, or even less, just start to experiment. Familiarize yourself. Yeah, yeah. familiarize yourself, start with, with, with small doses and, 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 and grow it from there. If, if, if what you're looking for is a big transformational experience don't try to take a big dose yourself find a facilitator that will hold the space for you if you don't have a facilitator but you have access to psilocybin it's totally cool to do it with your friends but make sure that it's friends that you truly trust make sure that you're in a calm safe environment ideally in nature and uh, be careful on dosing this you know S- build it up slowly and and familiarize yourself. Um, this, that's my recommendation. Because for the true transformative experience, you know, what what the neuropsychopharmacologists they found now with this new fMRI machine is that this psilocybin reduced the blood supply in these three key areas of the brain that they call the default mode network, mm-hmm. which is the closest thing to your egoic armor. Mm-hmm. So. You know, when the blood supply is reduced in this area and this system is like weakened, mm. Michael Pollan says that it's like the director of the orchestra of your brain falls asleep. Yes. So now the brain, all the different departments, your sense of self-esteem, your patience, your anger, your jealousy, your, all your different rooms in your brain now are free mm-hmm. to express themselves. So in that moment, there is the transformative potential where you can feel like you never felt before mm-hmm. and you can really reinvent yourself. Mm-hmm. But so what is the threshold when does the, 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 the director of the orchestra falls asleep? You know, is it going to be you take two grams, it's just a bit distracted, you take four grams, 
is just like snoozing and at seven gram you fall asleep and the brain is really free. <coughs> you, you know what I mean? Because I've, I've been listening to Stan Groff. He, had, he gave a great interview with, with Tim, Tim Ferriss and it's a great entry to the Stan Groff world, which is the grandfather of psychedelic therapy. If you listen that that, that podcast with Tim Ferriss, he says that, you know, now psychedelic is very fashionable and popular, but it's too low of a dose. Mm-hmm. Stan Groff says that if you want a transformative effect, you need to go for the, for the big dose. But, you know, not alone. <laughs> there's, there's definitely something to it. And, but I don't think that everybody necessarily needs a big dose. I mean, at some point in your life, you should definitely experience it and but this should really be done in a very controlled environment yeah. and I, d- I do think that you know there is something uh, true to what he says and obviously <laughs> he is very qualified to make that type of statement and and uh, there's something about the peak experience and the ego dissolution that helps you break through from one state to another um, but I also think that there is tremendous amount of value to the small dose experience as well. So if you know that there is something deep that you need to resolve, if you feel that there is something that is in a meaningful way holding you back from feeling good about yourself and 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 you know that there's an obvious trauma sitting there then you know go for the big dose but but really be very careful in the context that you take it and make sure that it's an experienced facilitator and make sure that you feel comfortable with the space and the person. If there's even a shadow of a doubt, then wait. He's not going to go you, away, yeah. No, this is, this is really the key of everything. As long as you trust the environment, you can brave anything that arrives. <laughs> nice. Thank you for saying that, uh, Christian. Next compound on our list is LSD. That's a big one. <laughs> <coughs> so LSD, it was interesting because after my early experiences with, with psilocybin, I had almost seven years where I didn't smoke cannabis and I didn't take any psychedelics until I visited Amanda Fielding at Beckley and we smoked some charas and it was the first reconnection to cannabis and it's my favorite form of cannabis, uh, Indian charas. And it was just like, wow, I miss this so much. And then she opened up my door to LSD and to this whole world and it completely transformed my life. She really gave me a platform in many ways and we've been very close ever since and I hope that she feels that I've contributed to, to her path as well. But but really Amanda facilitated an, an incredible expansion for me in my relationship to, to psychedelic compounds. And when she started talking about it, it was just so obvious because I had the psilocybin experience and I knew that this was it. This is... This is uh, this is going to be a key part of 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 healing uh, in the future and 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 lsd i've never taken in a, a ceremonial context i've never taken it with a healing purpose i've actually only done it recreationally and not heroic doses so it's uh, it's a funny one. Many people had LSD as their big breakthrough substance and breakthrough experience. But for me, it's, it's been a much more of a, a gentle relationship, very nice and very playful. But it hasn't had this kind of like deep, profound effect on me as, as for example, ayahuasca. But I love it. I think it's, I think it's a incredible substance in the, in the first part is is that it's measured in micrograms so you know the physical impact on your body is very very limited it's very precise and very direct and it lasts very long and i think the future of lsd is a microdosing substance it's perfect for microdosing i think it's going to be a big compound for for the older population i think in palliative care for example aging uh, Precisely for the reason that it's so precise, you know, your body needs to process very little material and 
it goes straight to where it needs to go and it lasts for a long time. And this is really where I see LSD's future. I don't see it as the macrodose substance of choice. I don't see it as the healing, transformative compound of the future. I think there's other compounds that do this in a much more effective way than LSD. And big dose LSD is probably going to be more linked to big festivals and big celebrations. I I, I see it uh, more as a celebratory and a microdosing compound. Of the- Even if there is a book now by Christopher Bash, LSD and the Mind of the Cosmos, something like that, we'll put in the show notes, where he's been doing high dose LSD for like 20 years, like three times a year. And he did end up exploring a, a, another world, a, a world where ultimately there will be a superhuman, this idea that he would, you know, when you have a big dose and you go on the other side, when, 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 when he would then go take the same dose again, he would basically go back to where he left the first time and mm-hmm. after several sessions he would become no more a visitor of those real but like a resident oh wow and with and yeah I'm, I'm 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 listening to it right now and that's also interesting B- pinchback in the in the third uh, psychedelic confession episode was saying that lsd is the only one he feels that is a little bit immoral Mm. He doesn't maybe have the the, 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 the the moral support of the other medicine where there is something about everything is going to be okay. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, Alejandro was speaking yeah. about cocaine versus mambe. Mm. And I think this is a, a, a good analog if you take psilocybin versus LSD. LSD is, you know, very much something that is, you know, developed in, in a lab the concentration of the compound is extremely high. Uh, and I do feel that you don't have this connection to nature as you do in the plant medicine world. And I, that it's very difficult to reach those concentrations with psilocybin. You need to cons- consume an incredible amount of mushroom to arrive at, say, a 700 mic dose of acid, but with, with, with mushrooms, with, with acid, you can go so much further because you can process it. And there's something that is... So I, I, can, I can definitely see how that is. And, and, and I find there is a difference between plant medicines and, and chemical compounds. And, and typically... When I use psychedelics for any reason, I like to stay with one or the other. And, you know, so if, I, if I'm in a celebratory context, you know, I like to stick with a combination of, let's say, MDMA, LSD and ketamine uh, and not include... Uh, psilocybin or San Pedro or but you know either go chemical or either go uh, plant although it's an interesting it can also balance the 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 LSD by introducing something that is connected to nature but for example I like to mix LSD with mezcal and I think mezcal gives this very profound earthly connection and when I put them together it it, it just feels good there's nothing uh, scientific about it I just feel that it complements each other well mm. but there is a, a there is something to that that it is amoral I don't know if I would call it amoral but there's definitely not that you can appreciate nature on acid but it's not the same as belonging. Connection, yeah. connection as I feel yeah. with the other psychedelics. Yeah, it's interesting this topic of you know synthetic versus natural because you know if you if you can recreate natural compound right you can do like synthetic psilocybin mm-hmm. and apart there's this famous story Jeremy Narby told me that some scientists brought to Maria Sabina this psilocybin curandera mm-hmm. some synthesized fa- you know artificial psilocybin and she said yes there is spirit. <laughs> I mean, I believe that there's spirit in everything on this planet. But, you know, know, just look at cannabis. And when you talk about full-spectrum cannabis versus isolated 
THC and compounds sure. and, sure. and, and you know LSD doesn't have the entourage effect and even though LSD have clearly have spirit and psilocybin clearly have spirit you you receive a much broader spectrum if you take the natural compound yes I just want to say that Amanda turned me on with LSD also <laughs> in, in Puglia in Sicily we, we'll put on the show notes everything about Amanda Fielding and the foundation and everything else this is very interesting I think we are hopefully helping lots of people with a lot of confusion around this compound okay this is a big one for both of us <laughs> ayahuasca so um, ayahuasca completely changed my life in, in, in such a profound way and I'm eternally grateful for uh, having the privilege of, 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 of <laughs> encountering this spirit <laughs> and it's, it's so hard to begin with ayahuasca, where do you begin? And, and ayahuasca is like all the other compounds and pretty much everything in life, it's not one thing, it's a tool. And depending on which setting you experience ayahuasca and which, which intention you experience ayahuasca, you're gonna have achieved different things. And the way I experienced ayahuasca and, and, and met ayahuasca was through a facilitator that had trained many years with the Shipibo traditions and then switched over to Santo Daime and worked many years with Santo Daime and then created his own design that was very much focused on nature. He speaks uh, a lot about inner and outer transformation or inner and outer restoration. And uh, uh, compared to many other traditions that usually you have the ceremony at nighttime, he often facilitates daytime and often takes you out in nature. <clears throat> And let's nature be the shaman rather than him being the shaman. And he does it in such a beautiful and graceful way. And, uh, and I didn't really have a big, profound experience. The first time. And I, I, I listened to Alejandro's podcast last night. And, and I remember him talking about his first experience. It was a lot of physical purging. And then, but then perceiving the change in the weeks after and this is how it was for me it was in this ceremony i did not have big visions or transformative experiences i didn't dance with god i didn't face my fears i didn't experience ego dissolution it was much more of a frequency and an energy and this frequency and this energy has pretty much guided my life ever since and every time i have a a ceremony with ayahuasca I reconnect to this frequency and this frequency of harmony and when I come back into life I I, I become much more attentive to frequencies and it be, become more and more clear to me that you know everything carries frequency everything has a vibration you drink too much alcohol, the next morning you wake up and your body is shaking. When you're angry and you're shouting, your body starts shaking. It's a frequency. Every word that you say, every thought that you think carries a frequency and a vibration. And what I think ayahuasca does in such a beautiful way is to harmonize your frequency. And when you come back into life after a well-facilitated ayahuasca experience, you can pick it up in your day-to-day -day life. For example, I stopped drinking Coca-Cola from one day to another. I drank Coca-Cola every lunch, every dinner for years. And then I was just like, wow, this doesn't resonate with me anymore. And you can start to feel like, oh, wow, this relationship has doesn't make me feel good. And all of a sudden, I started to make decisions in my life based on frequency and 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 vibration rather than than logic and thoughts so i would still use my mind to come up with ideas but rather than thinking about if this is a good idea feeling how that makes me feel and 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 having this frequency and vibration of the ayahuasca as as the reference of where i want to be uh, in peace and harmony and i'm just fascinated i dr i drank ayahuasca now for 
uh, almost 10 years and had many, 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 many ceremonies. And I've seen people go through all kinds of challenges and processes and difficult nights. And I still haven't seen anyone that has not arrived at a good place. And this is something, you know, the, the, you talk about ayahuasca as the grandmother and the grandmother spirit. And the grandmother can be very tough uh, on you, can be very direct with you, can make you f f face what you need to face, but your grandmother loves you <laughs> and she will never let anything bad happen to you. And mm. she will always bring you home mm. to shore at the end. And there's something just remarkable about ayahuasca. And, you know, when we're looking at psilocybin, for example, now, you know, there's a wave of psilocybin and, you know, left, right and center, there's facilitators that are creating their own ceremony designs. And, you know, last summer, I think we saw, you know, a lot of this in Ibiza with these kind of like, it's not a ceremony, it's not a party, it's somewhere in between, it's not microdoses, it's not full doses, but it's still big doses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it doesn't always end up in this end point where everyone feels that you have arrived at shore, you know? And, and I think uh, we, we cut our line, we, our lineage, usually, you know, the elders give us this perspective and this, this framework for us to, to handle life and handle reality. And, and we, we, we cut this in Europe. We killed all the shamans. We, you know, stopped the line, lines and traditions. And I think we still we don't have this respect for the elder. Yeah, and we don't have this framework. And, and I, I think, you know, you just see it. There's a lack of discipline in our cultures, we struggle to be disciplined with ourselves and we abuse almost everything that arrives into our society. You know, just look at tobacco, look at coca. It's not just uh, master plants and, 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 and sacred plants. You know, tobacco is the most sacred plant of them all in, in, uh, in ancient traditions in Latin America. But here we've abused it uh, with devastating consequences. The same with cocaine and pretty much everything that arrives into our con culture, we abuse it from sex to uh, work to sugar to alcohol. We have a fundamental lack of, of, of discipline. And I think that ayahuasca arrived to teach us this, mm. to educate us. And it's remarkable because with many of the compounds, you can learn how to handle them. But with ayahuasca, you know, you, I've seen people that have been drinking ayahuasca for 20 years and then they arrive to one ceremony and they're on the floor and completely out of control and cannot hold themselves. And this is the thing with ayahuasca. You can never become complacent with ayahuasca. Uh, every experience is unique. Every ceremony is unique. And if you stop paying attention, then you will struggle. Uh, and this is why ayahuasca ceremonies, people treat them with a significant amount of humility and attention and respect for the process and the compound that you don't see with any other psychedelic substance. Pretty much every other psychedelic substance have become also a recreational substance. Ayahuasca is not. You never meet someone in a party that said, oh, I just took a chupito yeah. of ayahuasca because it's so unpredictable and, and it's forcing us to develop discipline in a way that no other plant medicine or psychedelic compound has done. And I, I see it almost as that's the role it's serving to us, is to educate ourselves on how to not just treat psychedelics and ceremonies with humility, attention and respect, but to treat life with, with this level of, of, of attention and humility. And... Uh, for for me, ayahuasca has. I'm I'm following the the tradition of Santo Daime more than any other uh, tradition. Even though I've had 
other experiences, but for me, this is really a, an, an education. I go there to train my capacity to hold myself, to keep myself centered, to keep myself calm, to keep myself attentive to the subtleties of, of, of life. And uh, for me, there's been no greater teacher than, than ayahuasca in that sense. Amazing, amazing. Great sharing. You were saying that that feeling of come back home that you have in the morning with ayahuasca is rare to have with mushroom, for example. But don't you think that is mainly due because of the guidance and the facilitator and the format of a beginning, middle and end of, of the shaman taking you there? No, absolutely. And this is how it arrives to us. It arrives with, with a lineage with knowledge, with tradition, and then the unpredictable nature of it makes people attentive and honor these, these, this design, if you like. And, 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 and this very much contributes to this outcome, that you have an arc, that you have a journey that has a beginning and a middle and an end. And I think we will over time learn how to use this knowledge for our native compound psilocybin for example here in Europe but there is something psilocybin does not arrive with this structure to enable us to to hold this space it's not educating us in the way that that ayahuasca is, is edu yeah, educating yeah, us yeah it's like it's, it's coming with the morphogenetic field yeah like Rupert Sheldrake would say of thousands of years of that absolutely so you go into that space yeah yeah and also the the unpredictability again and I think this is one of the most incredible uh, things about ayahuasca is the integration circles after when you sit and it's, it's so important and, and, and sometimes um, we forget to do it and I think it's important to always do it and honor that space especially when people are there for the first time because there's something incredible when you know you have 20 people or 40 people who have taken the exact same compound the exact same dose in the exact same setting with the exact same music and and then you listen and the experience radically oppo opposite radically and no experience is like another and this is the beauty of ayahuasca that it's so diverse and multifaceted and it can take you to so many different places that you know it it's 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 profound it's so would you say you do like what three four times a year so I would say that, you know, in the first few years, I did maybe one retreat a year um, and I didn't get any visions. I, I, I'm not a very kind of like visual person. Some people have told me like your third eye is closed. So, <laughs> you know, it's something that I want to work on. But I was I was really frustrated about this. And I was like, why am I not receiving the visions? And I was every ceremony like begging for it to arrive and and I started to go into my ceremonies with the same intention surrender 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 and and then I started to surrender in life and then the visions came and I realized it was not about surrendering in the ceremonies it was about surrendering in, in life, life. Mm -hmm. and I would say today I'm 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 a student of 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 ayahuasca and, and in particular a student of, of Santo Daime and and I try to to drink maybe once a month. I, I don't recommend that. I think, you know, everyone should, uh, when the moment arrives, when it feels good, have an experience with ayahuasca, uh, see how it makes you feel. I think it's definitely something everyone should do at some point in their life. I think it's very good to have an annual retreat where you revisit and reevaluate your life and see where you are and see where you're going. And then for certain people, it's, it can be useful. Uh, it could be a calling to go into it, making it into your spiritual practice. But I do think that if you are going to make ayahuasca your spiritual practice and something that you regularly do, it needs to come with a, 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 a set of discipline because, you know, you can experience anything in the ceremony. Uh, it doesn't matter unless you're able to integrate that and ground that in your life. So, for example, in, in the Santo Daime tradition, there's a significant amount of focus put on the diet, for example. And there's 
many different reasons why the diet is important. But one of the reasons and one of the key reasons is that ayahuasca is very difficult for your body and especially your liver to process. And if you drink regular ayahuasca, you need and you continue to eat red meat and you continue to drink alcohol, you are overloading your your liver. So if you want to make ayahuasca a regular practice in your life, you need to be much more attentive to what what food you eat and how much alcohol you drink. And another thing is also the grounding and, and, and Santo Daime, a core part of Santo Daime is meditation practices. You see it in most of the, 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 the kind of Daime communities that have been successful and achieved longevity is, is that there's a core meditation practice that comes with it. And, you know, it, people talk about it a lot. I don't think people talk about it enough. Uh, it's really about what you do in your life. And I think Alejandro explained it beautifully in his talk. You know, it's about increasing your baseline. And this is about all psychedelics. And when you look at the graphs from, for example, psilocybin studies, it's very clear. You have a baseline, you have the uh, psychedelic experience, you get an elevation, and then you slowly revert to the mean. And, And the key is not how far you can go, and how high you can go in this in the in the in the Ele- psychedelic experience or how much you can elevate yourself it's about can you increase the baseline and how do you increase your baseline for me i've been following the frequency and the frequency in terms of food the frequency in terms of substances you know how much alcohol i drink how much coffee i drink but also the frequency in your relationship do you have toxic relationships in your life do you have, do you have a work that is giving you a lot of stress and anxiety do you have unresolved issues and slowly slowly lack of purpose <coughs> you need to start resolving these things in your life and this is what's going to make the change in, in your life the the racing of your day-to-day state of being and and this is key and and if you don't focus on this and if you don't complement an ayahuasca practice with daily rituals if you like so for me you know my uh, life really started to change when i implemented a, a, a daily morning practice that every day i bring myself back into this place of intention connecting to my heart connecting to my physical body bringing my mind down, reminding myself to calm my mind, reminding myself to be grateful, also physically stretching my muscle. I know that my I know where my stress goes. I need to stretch these places of my body. And then, you know, these are the things that ultimately makes the changes in your life, not the peak experiences. Amazing. That's that's beautiful. But so There is two metaphors that I keep on hearing. Right? I think one was Alan Watts who said, once you got the message, you hang up the phone. And then I think I think Geronimo told me that, you know, the psychedelic experience is like the boat that takes you on the other side of the river, mm-hmm. but then the journey continues on foot. Yes. So, but me and you and many people we know and with respect, we tend to keep on checking in with the with the with the medicine what 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 do you what do you answer people that say you have to do it once because you get the message once and that's it no, i think i think you need to be committed to a continuous process of evolution evolving your way of being and 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 increasing your well-being ultimately and and uh, for example for me a regular Santo Daime practice, this space, it gives me once a month a place where I can come back to myself and where I can, you know, have an inner journey and reflect on where I am with my relationships to myself, relationship to my friends and family, where I uh, am in relationship to nature and, 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 and slowly identify things that I can do to to put myself closer to state of continuous well-being and if if you can have a recurring practice that takes you to that place through ayahuasca that's a great but it cannot be the only thing that you do uh, if you think that this is going to be sufficient then you are not achieving um what you what you want i think ultimately 
And then there is also, uh, I organized the ayahuasca ceremony halfway through 2020, so in the middle of the first year of the pandemic. And I did it in Sweden with one of our friends. And I brought all my friends from Sweden together. And then we had this one ceremony. And then a few months later, I was really reflecting, well, what did we do here? What, what did we achieve? And I spoke to them after and they said, you know, in the middle of this endless, you know, state of uncertainty and fear and confusion and restrictions, uh, there was this space where we were just together. And it was like, I can describe it like a Tesla supercharged to the heart. It just filled our heart space and coming together. And I think you can never, there's always going to be important to arrive back to that space. So if you're a few times a year, come together in a celebratory ceremony where there's room and space for process as well, but where the key focus is to harmonize your frequency as a group, connect to your heart, connect to each other, and, and just remind yourself of that space, I think that's something that is absolutely something that I encourage everyone, if you have access to this type of ceremony or this type of space, it's not something that you do once and then you don't have to do it again. It's something that definitely have benefit, but it, it all comes back to what's the intention. So for me, the Santo Daime is a spiritual practice. It teaches me discipline. It helps me. I come into this space. I sit up on the chair. I don't cross my legs. I look up into the light. I follow the scenario, I sing, and all the waves keep coming at me, and I focus on my breathing, and it helps me to prepare for when the waves come in life. So yeah. the light comes, the joy love comes, the excitement comes, the fear comes, the sadness comes, everything comes and it hits me, and I'm practicing my capacity to hold my center and keep my breath calm. And I went through a separation last year, and. I could really see like, wow, this gave me the tools to wake up every morning and center myself. And when the sadness came and when the pain came and when the fear came, I could hold myself. And it was very much linked to my experience with Santo Daime, giving me these tools. And this is a spiritual continuous practice. And then you have the more dieta type of, 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 of ceremonies where you go for multiple days. And Alejandro spoke very beautifully about that, when you can go really, really deep into the nuances of your life and your being and how you relate to yourself and how you relate to others. And you can really kind of have a reset of, of, of your life. And I think that's very beneficial. And that's something I encourage everyone to do once a year, really have a deep dive and, 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 and check in with yourself. And then you have work like, you know, Matthew and the Temple of the Way of Light. This is surgical ayahuasca. This is next level. This is about dealing with ancestral trauma. This is dealing with deep, deep, deep blockages in your life. And this, I think, yes, that type of experience, I'm not sure you need it regularly or frequently. This is something that you do. It's like open heart surgery, <laughs> while San Santo Daime is more like your, your yoga practice or your therapy session. So it really depends on what are you looking for. Are you looking for an annual reset, check in with yourself, making sure you're in the right path? Or are you looking for a spiritual practice that helps you develop tools that you can use in your day-to-day -day life to stay present and stay calm and stay focused and stay attentive? Or are you trying to kind of resolve a deep personal yeah. trauma? And yeah. depending on what you are looking for, yeah. and if, you know, what I described in my relationship to Santo Daime, you can get this from many other places. You can get that through a yoga yeah. practice. You can get this through a meditation practice. And it's not either or. And this kind of annual check-in, you can get this from Vipassana or uh, silent retreats where you really get space to go deep over extended period of time, a week or 10 days. So it, it, it all comes back to what, what are you trying to achieve? And depending yeah. on what you're trying to achieve, you need to find the right modality. Amazing, amazing. We spend a lot of time on, on ayahuasca. I knew it. <laughs> okay, let, um, let's put them together. San Pedro and Peyote. So San Pedro and Peyote, I 
have a deep, deep uh, appreciation for, for both of these. The same person who introduced me to ayahuasca is from the Andes in Argentina, and he's developed a way of working with, with San Pedro that I think is just remarkable. He calls it uh, solar rotation, and, and basically you have a large concentrated dose. He, he cooks the, the San Pedro almost like they cook ayahuasca with three reductions over 10 hours each. So it's a very concentrated tea that you drink, and it's a high dose, and um, it's uh, very similar with both San Pedro and, and peyote. Someone <laughs> told me this, that the hangover comes first. <laughs> so the first hour or two can feel quite unsettling. It's true. Physically, like your stomach, also you can feel a little bit queasy and uneasy and disoriented. <laughs> Until you arrive at, a, at what I find just an absolutely blissful state. Some people can experience visual, but this is not uh, the norm. Typically, it's not a visual psychedelic. You won't have visions, really. It's more a, 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 a physical uh, experience and, and, and a state of complete presence. And I, I catch myself sometimes in these solar rotations, and I'm like... I'm not feeling anything. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I've been sitting on a rock in the forest for five hours now and I'm loving it. So of course I'm feeling something because I could not just walk out in the forest and sit for five hours and feel amazing about it. And I think the clarity of thought is is just remarkable, very, very beautiful. And I have a deep appreciation for, for San Pedro Peyote. I've experienced it in the kind of Native American uh, traditions in a teepee. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful community ceremony. It's, it's, it, it really connects you with the heart in, in a beautiful way. And, and I love how they are opening up the space for everyone to contribute in terms of prayer. It really helps to form intentions, intentions coming from your heart and sharing those intentions with others and really grounding those intentions. I think, you know, anyone that get a chance to, to sit in a, in a teepee ceremony in a Native American tradition should really do it. I think there's few ceremonies that I've seen that connects you to, you know, the forces that governs our existence, the forces of nature in a, in a better way than, than they do. And I find them beautiful and profound. And then I think that's also a very good entry into uh, psychedelic ceremonial experiences. If you're a little bit nervous about ayahuasca and big you know, psychedelic visual experiences, then this is a good starting point because, you know, you can you can have processes in 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 these type of ceremonies as well, but they are not as overwhelming as uh, typically <laughs> as as ayahuasca, for example. And and then, but obviously, San Pedro and Peyote uh, have become also used frequency uh, recreationally and. I uh, resonate with Alejandro there. I, I enjoy it a lot. I, I, I try to use it both as microdose and, and also for celebrations. I think it's a beautiful yeah. celebratory exactly. the compound. Exactly. The word celebratory is better than recreation. Absolutely. <laughs> and and I, think it, I think it's beautiful. I, I, I often serve it at, at, at gatherings to celebrate, and I think it's... It's beautiful. The, the challenge with peyote, which I think is very, very important, for everyone to appreciate is there is scarcity and there is abuse of the the source and we are diminishing the the, the sources and and it is problematic the, the, there is it's you you, you have um, traditional plantations people that have planted and managed cultivations of peyote for hundreds of years and that are now being abused by people that are going out and for profiting, harvesting. And, and peyote is very delicate. It takes a long time for a peyote button to be mature. And then depending on how you harvest it, it's either going to regrow or it's not. And there's a, a, a huge increase in the demand of peyote, which has led to a huge increase in kind of like pirate harvesters that go out and, and harvest plantations that are not their own 
wild wild and wild uh, uh, existing peyotes and harvesting it in the wrong way and it's it's really one of those negative externalities of the increased use of plant medicine you see it with ayahuasca as well where we are kind of depleting the sources from the native tribes traditions that have been using these compounds for for many 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 generations and it's it's problematic and i i, I definitely as much as i love peyote <laughs> I, i i recommend anyone who lives in europe to to go for san pedro because san pedro grows here it grows in abundance here in ibiza for example you can just throw a peyote on the ground and it will grow <laughs> you know you don't even have to plant it it's it's an incredibly Uh, resilient I mean, San Pedro. Yeah. So I, I, I really recommend everyone to use uh, San Pedro. And if you're going to use peyote, really make sure, ask yourself, where is this coming from? Ask questions about how it's harvested, what's the lineage, and, and ideally make sure that it's linked to either Native American church or or or, or tribes in, in, in Mexico that, that have a... Uh, have the right relationship with it and and harvest it with uh, with intention yeah. the right intention Th thank you very important very important advice okay we are reaching out at the end now we have the last couple that we can also talk together because they are from the same family DMT and 5-MeO DMT. <laughs> so 5-MeO DMT, I've experienced it once and it was a, not a good experience and I, I didn't have the full experience. I was a burning man. I was alone at burning man. I had taken acid before. I was walking past a friend's camp and then I knocked on the door of a, of a, of a dome and they just kind of like dragged me in and there was this group of... <laughs> upstate New York, uh, uh, you know, alternative circle, s sitting there enjoying this ceremony, which was beautifully facilitated, I have to say. The, the, the woman who facilitated spoke beautifully. It was me and another person sitting next to each other, and they used this vape, uh, volcanic vape, and I, I, I inhaled it, and halfway through the inhalation I could already feel the compound coming and I just got this kind of like flash of my child and this kind of like sense of like wait where am I who am I with what is this and I, I just started to kind of like freak out and yeah. and I, I, I could feel the force of the 5-MeO coming and I was pushing it back And it was okay. I didn't have a negative experience, but I just didn't feel safe. But do enough. you think that how much LSD you had taken and how many hours before? Maybe two, three hours. I'd taken maybe 50 mics or something like that. I mean, that's not a great place to start. You should, you know, yeah. the, 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 this... One other time. Yeah, but, but then I never reconnected with, with 5-MeO. And I think two things that have kind of cautioned me with 5-MeO is, you know, I've seen two types of facilitator that makes me a little bit worried. One is the macho type. Mm. And for me, I, I, I always get worried when I'm around macho energy because macho energy uh, uh, pushes the boundaries and typically makes us take unnecessary risks. And, and I just don't feel comfortable in that space. So that has put me off. And I've also seen a lot of inexperienced facilitators that, you know, with ayahuasca, there's a tremendous amount of discipline. You know, if you arrive to an ayahuasca ceremony that is well held, you typically have people with 10, 15 years of experience and a tremendous amount of discipline and training that goes into it. Yeah, But with 5M, yo, I've seen these facilitators. We're like, wait a minute, where where did you get your training from? And and how long have you been doing this? Oh, yeah, I've been serving for a year. It's like, what? And then I've, I've seen quite a few examples. One which is unique of facilitators developing an a, a unhealthy relationship to the substance and, 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 and losing themselves. This is not something I've seen with any other compound. And also people that really have struggled to integrate the experience. On the flip side, I've seen and heard so many remarkable stories that few other compounds can can generate this this arguably no other compound can take you to the place that 5-MeO can take you to. So fast. And I do think that there's, you know, in, in, in the psychedelic drug development world, in, you know, the, 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 the 
value of the peak experience is is something that is there is a, 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 a strong hypothesis around that the the ability to overcome you know a a, a state of depression is very linked to the the scope of the experience. And I do think that 5-MeO can take you to a place that few other compounds can take you to. And I've heard so many beautiful uh, stories. And and uh, But that is also why I felt very good about what Beckley SciTech is doing and invested a significant amount of my money into Beckley SciTech and a lot of my time also into it. And we're using 5-MeO. And I think 5-MeO, for this reason, the reason why people are comfortable facilitating, I believe, is that the, 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 the experience is so short, you know, and it's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so if you're going to hold a space like with ayahuasca of 20 people for six, seven hours, it's very difficult to do and you need a lot of training. To hold one person's space for 20 minutes is much easier to do. And, and, but it's so important that it's done right. And that's why I think there's a, a great role for 5-MEO in a clinical setting, dealing with very, very difficult mental challenges. And, and I do think that for certain people and certain processes and challenges, 5-MEO can be extremely useful. But I really, I haven't found a space where I feel comfortable to, to take it yet because, um, and I'm sure that moment is going to come one day, but I haven't, I haven't arrived there yet. Yeah. And what about the traditional DMT from Chakruna, Mimosa, from the plant kingdom? No, I haven't actually experienced the, the kind of natural DMT like Changa, but I, I did smoke after that 5-MEO experience. I, I, I went to another camp where I had friends <laughs> that are like, you know, the, the, the camp that facilitated the 5-MEO. It's beautiful people. I, I know them, but it didn't feel like my tribe. And then I went to another camp that was really my tribe. And then we smoked 5-MEO and I went poof, all the way the same, to the other side. The same. No, no, no sorry. <coughs> DMT. DMT. And then I went straight to the peak experience. Mm. And that was beautiful. But, but again, I haven't really... I, I think the peak experience can be useful for very specific uh, intentions when you need to kind of like go from one place to another when you need to leave something behind. But for me, the most benefit I received from these compounds is not necessarily inside the peak experience. It's on the way up and on the way down. Yeah. And in the ceremonial context where you're really given the space to kind of go deeper into your feelings, go deeper into this state. And I think for me, it's an interesting place to go to and visit, like a, almost like entertainment, but I, I haven't found it that useful as a healing process. So I've never really been attracted to go back to it, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, DMT is mostly used when people have desire to connect with, um, you know, entities or, you know, our friend calls them sentient, independent sentient mm. beings. Yeah. And uh, there's uh, lots of literature and, you know, the, 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 the verdict is out if it's, you know, a projection of your own imagination or there are really independent sentient mm. beings that... Not only they are independent, but they might even help us with human affairs. Yeah, that uh, that's a big question. I think you know. I think for the. Did you want to cover ketamine as well? Sure, because this is one of my. Uh, I love ketamine. I think sure. it's. Uh, uh, well, it, ketamine is is like the, yeah. the 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 ugly duckling of the uh, uh, psychedelic family. A, li a little bit, a and little it bit. has. <coughs> A lot of issues attached to it. You know, you can develop a destructive relationship to ketamine, but it is also a profound a compound. And it's, it's For depression, right? Well, you have the, the kind of peak uh, experience ketamine for depression, which creates about a two-week relief of, of, of kind of acute anxiety. And it's, it's very useful if you're in a state where you are like, uh, okay, I, I'm suicidal and you're at going through a really rough patch, then the way that the ketamine clinics works, you go in there, you have a high dose, and then for about two weeks you have a relief from that hole that you've been in. So this is in America. In America, this they're, is in America. They're, they're legal, yeah. And, and, and in Europe as well, actually. You, you have it in the UK, you have it here in Spain, <coughs> you have it. It's coming more and more. But I've, I've actually enjoyed... And, and, and 
but sorry, Christian, in this in this medical setting, okay, maybe 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 there is the the the, the, the suicidal crisis and the two weeks relief, but this protocol usually allow for a couple of years of 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 reduction of pain from depression after a set of of, of injection no not not really, not really. It's, it's pretty short lived i mean the way that esketamine came through the kind of the kind of like clinical try the regulatory framework was not as a a, a continuous improvement of your condition. It was for a short-term acute relief. Oh, well, like emergency. Yeah, yeah, emergency. And 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 this is also. I I'm I haven't invested in any ketamine clinics. I think it's it's a lot of sharks coming in there. I think it will be definitely a lot of unethical operators in this space and it's going to require a lot of disciplines for those who work with ketamine to do it right because I remember we, we looked at a project and we were talking about it and, and, and you say someone like with ketamine coming in and you say like okay we found a way to because at the end of the day it's never about the peak experience it's about what can the peak experience allow you to change in your life to improve your situation. And then if you come to the board of a company and you say, hey, guys, I figured out if we, you know, complement this experience with, you know, a community platform for people to stay engaged like AA or with therapy or with uh, diet or with yoga or meditation, then we can actually extend people's need to come back from two weeks to four weeks. You know, the consequence of that is like, well, well, that's a great idea, but you just increased our costs and slashed our revenues by half. Uh, it's not something that, you know, necessarily is going to be an easy sell. And it's going to require brave operators uh, to really believe in that in the long term, efficacy is going to make the difference. And in the long term, you know, the, the people that can give the best healing outcome is going to survive. But in the short term, the ones that are going to make the most money are the people who are going to milk the symptoms rather than being focused on on, on, on improving the baseline. And uh, that's why I think there's going to be a lot of sharks around the ketamine space. But, but I also do think that ketamine is celebratory ketamine. <laughs> For you personally, what was your experience? I, I, I had this uh, experience with my family. We were sitting all in a board meeting or after a dinner after a board meeting, and there was some, you know, uh, you know, a very formal setting, and they were all talking about their holiday experience, and they said, ah, oh, well, we were heli skiing and we were skiing off piste and they were talking about how dangerous it was and how you know avalanches were happening and people crashed into trees and you know people die in this context and then they came to me and I was like sitting there and I was looking around and I had been to Freaky Farm the week before and had a big big party and they said like so Christian what have you been up to lately and I was like ah oh, fuck it I was like yeah this weekend I took lots of acid and then bump of K and it was just the most amazing and they were like what, what, what are you talking about what's that acid LSD oh, ketamine they were like started googling it on their phones like horse tranquilizers what are you talking about this sounds crazy they were all in shock and I was like look guys you just been talking about heli skiing this is absolutely dangerous would you recommend someone without the appropriate experience to go heli skiing Absolutely not. It would be a crazy thing to do, super dangerous. And it's the same thing with, with drugs. I, I wouldn't recommend anyone to mix MDMA, LSD, and ketamine unless you know how to use these compounds. And everything is about timing and dosing. And for me, my favorite, like... In a celebratory, in a party, for example, what I love is like a little bit of mezcal, <laughs> a little bit of acid, like, you know, building up my 20 microdose. 20 micrograms. Yeah, well, you know, 20, maybe three, four times. So you kind of work your way up towards 100 mm -hmm. over an hour, an hour and a half. And then a few hours in, a bump of K, but really a bump, you know, not a line, but a bump. And then it activates the psychedelic and the, the way that ketamine and LSD together 
creates just an incredible space. Because uh, the, the ketamine is d- disassociative. Yeah, and it's also, well, first of all, it kind of like brings everything here, you know? It's almost like you take a big big umbrella and you just bring down all the kind of like colors mm. of the LSD and it becomes very kind of like present instead of being this abstract visuals, they become very present. And then I think it numbs the finger somehow. And, and, and there's something with the kind of energies. All of a sudden you kind of like melt together. And you like, if you want to do this, it really needs to be like a small gathering, like not a thousand people and a small party, like uh, 30, 40, 50 people and only people that you feel very, very comfortable with because you you arrive at a very vulnerable state. But it's such a blissful and beautiful state and it goes so well with music, with dancing and, you know, it just melts the whole dance floor and energetically you can like, the energy just kind of transfers from person to person and you build this beautiful collective vibe and with the you can have a little bit of MDMA as well you have the heart you have the visuals you have the the kind of like an energetic uh, melting pot on the dance floor i think it's absolutely beautiful and if you and you you need so little you know just two three shots of mezcal two three microdoses of acid a little bump of k and the experience is very big but the amount of substance that you have actually taken is very little and you wake up the next morning and you feel amazing yeah. uh, and this this for me if if i don't do it very often these days maybe once or twice a year but you know i think it's a wonderful uh, uh, celebratory way of using k and 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 it goes very well but k is is, is a companion substance as much as its own entity and you know you, you <clears throat> when you combine it with alcohol, it acts in one way. You combine it with cocaine, it acts in another way. You combine it with MDMA, it acts in a, another way. And with psychedelics, uh, another way. And I think just the psychedelic and the K combination in the right forms, either on a small dose in a party setting or like um, John Lilly, who did these 400 mics of intravenous acid and then huge amount of ketamine, also intravenous, and then into a flotation cham- chamber for hours. And, you know, he was describing the most remarkable states of psychedelic experiences. I think that marriage between LSD and ketamine is a, is a really beautiful one. Amazing. Christian, we are very grateful. 90 minutes, perfect timing. I will really want to thank you for your um, candor and honesty. And, you know, I remember 10, 15 years ago, people were, st- there was still so much taboo. And I think a conversation like that, public conversation, could not have happened. So I think we should um, really salute the researcher and the scientists and the policymakers that have been fighting to integrate this compound. And and I really respect the fact that, you know, despite your, you know, ayahuasca practice as almost as an as a existential companion to, to live a more f- a fuller, more centered life, then you're very open about the celebratory aspect, which, you know, done with the right knowledge and tools like you do can be much healthier than, you know, this night at the pub when people drink like <laughs> 10 pints so thank you very much thank and you, yeah, anything and, and anything I, you want to leave us with yeah I, I just want to leave everyone with an organization called ICERS I think the work that they are doing yeah is, we is had just him on the podcast amazing yeah I think the work that they are doing is 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 really really remarkable and very very important and I know that Geronimo is this year going to give birth to his project and and I think there is so much knowledge and wisdom in in the in the ayahuasca community and I think by by organizing uh, uh, ourselves and organizing the facilitators and and, and really starting to understand these processes better and start to build a relationship with regulators. I think it's going to give so much uh, value and credibility to, um, to society. So I just want to give a shout out to ICERS, Ben and Geronimo and the whole team. They're doing an amazing work and I'm, I'm a very proud contributor to their, their journey. Abs- abs- absolutely. I concur and uh, we'll find on the show note everything about ICERS. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Giancarlo. Poca, sonara, sonara, yente.
Coca, su naray, su naray en ti. 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 Coca, su naray, su naray en ti.